I'm Adam Berenswag. Um, I am currently the CTO of Clarify. We're a machine learning and uh, specifically focusing on image recognition and computer vision uh, here in New York. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, discussing some of the recent advances in artificial intelligence and computer vision and what that means um, to the sort of ongoing project of people who want to record everything that happens to them in their lives. Um, and uh, the implications of um, you know, the new technology on, on that larger project and what that would mean to society if that becomes widespread. A um, little more background on myself. I um, have a PhD from, uh, from Columbia. I originally studied speech and music and audio. Um, and then I spent 10 years at Google building various products uh, on top of machine learning, trying to get them into um, uh, you know, building useful things for people on top of, uh, on top of machine learning. Um, I worked on news and search uh, and eventually um, on music, which was my original uh, interest. And um, I think Google Music is still the only service where you can upload your own audio that you just recorded in a laptop in your basement and get recommendations uh, from that because we can work directly from the signal. Um, that was kind of my goal setting out um, building that. And um, then I worked on some computer vision related projects there, um, Google Goggles, which is um, the first you know, sort of widespread mass market um, <coughs> computer vision app. It was a, just a, a regular phone app which allowed you to point your camera at an object um, and we would tell you what it was. It worked great for logos and packaged products and worked terribly for people and chairs and dogs and anything that didn't look exactly like the thing that it you know, originally was. Um, it was more like fingerprinting, like Shazam, rather than like computer vision. And that was a very hard thing to explain to users, um, by the way, um, and hard to build a product around. But around the time I was working on that, um, there was uh, a very significant series of breakthroughs in, in terms of the underlying um, technology basically things that uh, now we call deep learning, um, which is just a marketing term really for neural networks. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. But um, then we were working at Google on various ways to turn that, um, turn that technology onto people's personal photos. Um, and we also were thinking about putting it into um, you know, wearables like um, Google Glass. Um, then I left Google uh, to, to help uh, form Clarify. And, um, and what we've been doing there um, is uh, continuing some of that work. And um, I'm just going to show uh, uh, one uh, sort of a few demos. Um, this, this first one will be kind of an orientation to uh, as far as if you haven't seen what the state of the art in computer revision is, um, you might be surprised. It's, it's um, quite, quite sophisticated and advanced now. So, um, there's still a long way to go, and we're not anywhere near sort of you know, general scene understanding and um, obviously the whole kind of cognition side on top. But where, where we are basically is getting to a point where we can point the camera at something and, uh, and tag it and understand, um, I don't like to use the word understand, um, and label the scene. And that, the, the way I see it, we're at a point now with the technology where um, you know, if you think about all the data that we have in the world that we compute on, it essentially was typed in by somebody somewhere. Either that or it's pixels in a sort of you know, video or, or a picture or a satellite picture or some kind of scientific sensor. But all that stuff, you know, until now, we pretty much had to, all we could do with it was record it, store it, play it back later, maybe add some tags on top. But that was something that somebody typed in. So what we're getting to now is, is, a, is a time where um, computers can start doing that typing for us. So oh, I have to say I'm not a robot. Um, so far, I'm not a robot. As far as you know. Um, so let me make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so I just threw this image in. It's a guy fishing. Uh, the tags here were water, lake, river, fly fishing, um, leisure. Um, and um, so it's quite, and then on the, on the right we have similar images. So these are kind of the two building blocks that we work with. One is basically labeling stuff, and the other is computing similarity, what, what images are similar. And the similarity is um, also trained with the neural network. And it's basically designed to, um, to learn a kind of blend of visual similarity and, and a high level um, uh, semantic level similarity. So these are not just you know, pictures of uh, a path in the forest with mist, you know, forest, fog, road, tree. But when you see the similarity, there's even sort of a compositional, um, a compositional similarity going on. Um, 
so just throw some more while I'm talking here. So lips, fashion, jewelry, um, and you know it can handle it can handle drawings, um, vehicle wheel design. Um, it can and and you know some of the interesting things is depending on what kind of training data you give it, it can learn. Um, that's my daughter. Uh, you can learn tags like fun, right? So um, it's not just about objects in the scene. There's sort of higher level sentiment laden semantic terms that it can, um, happiness. Um, okay, so um, that's where we are with the sort of the basic building blocks. Um, how does this stuff work? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the technology. Um, what's changed over the past couple of years that's, you know, allowed us to cross this threshold of, of um, usability, I'd call it. And, um, and then the second part of the talk, I'll talk about um, an experiment um, where, where I've you know, turned this technology onto um, a bunch of photos that I um, captured from a wearable camera that I wore for a couple months and what that means. So uh, deep learning is basically uh, neural networks. Um, neural networks have been around for, um, depending on how you count, since the 40s or 50s, definitely since the, since the 80s. Um, they had the first sort of commercial successes in the 80s. Um, and, um, but they were then out of favor for about 15 or 20 years. Um, and so the resurgence of neural networks is basically the story that I'm about to tell. Uh, I'll describe a little bit about the, the, the technology sort of under the hood, but basically, as all machine learning is, it's essentially a way to map inputs to outputs and to learn the patterns and inputs that are correlated with whatever output you're trying to learn. So here's a very simple schematic of a neural network. Um, you know, these nodes are input nodes and these nodes are output nodes. So this is going to be an animal detector. And um, if you were building a, if you already had very high level features extracted, like maybe this node represents whether there's black fur, this node represents whether there's pointy ears, this node represents whether there's feathers or whatever, then you could sort of, you know, you can kind of see how you could get a classifier out of that. You basically say, okay, there's some combination of fur and feathers. It's that owl, some combination of eyes and whatever. Um, it's a cat. Um, but basically, um, the, the project of the neural network is to, is to go from as far down as you can to the, to the raw input signal, which in our case is you know, image pixels, um, without having to hand design any of these features. You know, how do you know that there's fur? Well, maybe you had a fur detector, but the point of the neural network and specifically deep learning is that you've got many layers of, of learning um, in the neural network and it kind of uh, it learns increasingly more sophisticated semantic levels as you go up. Um, and, and the way that the neural network encodes memory is basically by the connection strengths between the neurons. So these are, um, uh, you know, this is, they're called neural networks because they were originally inspired by biological um, uh, neurons and the way that they're wired. Um, and, you know, the Hebbian principle, which says cells that wire together fire together. And, and that basically means that, you know, if um, you saw a certain kind of pixel shape and then somebody said cat, very high level, then uh, those neurons would fire together and then over time the, the strength would be increased and then you would learn that if you saw that particular pattern then it was a cat. Um, so <clears throat> how do you do that on images? Um, imagine this is an image, this is you know, maybe it's a letter U or a smile, I don't know what's going on with this image. Um, and so if, if, you, you had a, if you had neurons that were laid out in a grid, in the computer they're just you know, a long series, but you can conceptually organize them into a grid and, and associate them with the pixels. Then you present an image and um, the pixels have you know, intensity values. If they're bright or dark at different pixels, then that would basically be a strong or a weak input at some of these uh, neurons. And, um, and then basically you can build layers on top. So then. Um, then there would be the, the second layer of, of neurons wouldn't be recognizing, wouldn't, the input to them would be the pixels, but that what they would be learning and representing is something a little bit higher level than pixels. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's an edge or something like that. So let's peer inside. Okay, so actually, let me back up. Um, this technology in particular that we're working with is called the convolutional neural network, and that means it um, convolves little filters. So rather than presenting an entire image at once to the neural network, you take little patches, and you take many, many little filters that, that it learns as we go, and you sort of slide it around the image. Because a cat can be anywhere in the image, and an eye can be anywhere in the image. And so, because you want to be invariant to that kind of um, position in the image, uh, what you want to do is these little, little detectors that I'm just going to be an eye detector, and I'm going to slide around the image looking for an eye. Um, and in fact, it doesn't really do eye detectors. It does much lower level things. Um, the filters that it ends up learning tend to be sort of 
gradi oriented gradients of different colors and, and, and uh, frequencies or color blobs. And, um, and so this is, this is um, a picture of uh, the filters that were learned at the first layer of, of a particular neural network. Um, I think this was a, a one trained on ImageNet. Um, and you can see that, that what it's learned is you know, various orientations and, and gradients of color and, and frequency. Um, and what's, what's really crazy about this image is um, a few things. One is, if you give any neural network with sufficient sort of modeling power a data set of, from the real world of pretty much any type of imagery, um, even, even things that are not, even satellite imagery, other types of stuff, it's going to learn something very close to this. So there's something kind of like a basic uh, solution to the, to the problem of representing images that it seems to discover. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of mathematical theory that you can show that these images, these particular types of filters are actually very close to um, a, uh, a, a mathematical set of functions called the Gabor wavelets, which you can prove are sort of optimal for representing um, a certain type of images in the way that um, sine waves are optimal for representing repetitive um, uh, you know, periodic sound waves, or really any wave. So this is kind of a, a, a basis, a representation basis at a very low level for you know, representing images in an efficient way. And so the neural network has discovered it, its uh, mathematicians have discovered it, and there's even um, biological research where you can you know, poke um, probes into neurons in the visual cortex of, 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 of animals, and I find like, individual neurons that respond to, you know, that are sort of tuned to recognize like, these particular filters. So um, there's like something pretty cool about the fact that all these you know, um, ways of discovering the solution to this problem have kind of converged on the same thing. And what's you know, powerful in sort of a uh, machine learning sense is that for a long time computer vision researchers were like trying to design these things by hand and you know, thinking of what would be the optimal way to you know, compute some function to represent images. But nowadays with deep learning and neural networks you just feed it data and it learns this. Um, so here are some pictures that show kind of like peering inside a, a particular neural network. Like what is it learned um, at the various layers? And so um, this one is little patches of images from the training set that have responded highly to some of these filters. So I'm going to switch back for a second. So let's, let's look at a particular filter, maybe this like little um, purple patch down here. Down here. Um, and so if I skip ahead, oh, it looks more red in this, in this color scheme. But you can see that basically th those set um, or if I take one, maybe these vertical stripes up here, you can see it's learned some kind of, you know, it's found little patches of images that have that kind of vertical stripe. So that's like at the very bottom of the neural network. And then as you go up, this is um, filters at the second layer. Now it's learned curved edges, um, circles, sort of gradients, I mean, little checkerboard patterns. Um, and this is still like, you know, not close to any high level semantic representation. But once you get to the third level, you're even sort of, you know, seeing parts of objects, spokes of wheels, ears, even a whole, you know, dog-like face. Um, this training set was very dog-heavy. It's ImageNet. There's like 150 breeds of dog. It's supposed to learn to distinguish. So it gets a lot of um, animals. And then, so you know, at the top, if you look again at patches that have responded strongly to the various filters underneath, you can see, you know, classes of objects, computer keyboards, and dogs of a particular breed fruit. Um, so um, <clears throat> uh, that data set I just referred to several times is called ImageNet. It's, um, it represented by far the biggest um, training set for this problem, which we call general object recognition. Um, at the time, you know, previously before 2010, um, all the academic research, the data sets people were working with were on the order of hundreds or thousands of images. ImageNet um, had a million images and a thousand classes that were um, that you had to recognize in a sort of a academic benchmark competition. Um, so these are results um, from 2010 to 2014 for ImageNet. Um, and I've sort of color-coded the, 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 the results. So it, um, this is error rate, by the way. So lower is better. Um, you know, optimal would be zero, although we think that's actually not possible because the data set's badly labeled. Um, but so deep learning started in 2012. And, and what, what does that mean? So, um, like I said before, neural networks were, you know, had some success in the 80s, then they fell deeply out of favor. And there was only really a couple labs in the world that were still doing it. The other sort of um, more statistically motivated um, techniques were, were doing better. But what we know now is that we didn't have enough data to train it, and we weren't using large enough neural networks. Um, but Jeff Hinton at Toronto, Jan LeCun here at NYU, um, 
uh, and some other labs were kind of carrying the torch, keepers of the faith, they were really convinced that this was going to be the way that, um, that we were going to learn much more complicated systems than, than what was being used before. Um, and in, in 2012, Jeff Hinton and his students um, you know, blew everybody out of the water. Um, you know, that's like, so if you look at the results for the first couple years, it's like a one or two percent improvement year on year, which is pretty typical for a mature uh, a field like this where you just kind of, people are tweaking out like the last little um, optimizations of the existing algorithms. <clears throat> and then they came and, and, you know, opened up like a five percent or six percent um, performance gap. And what happened was they, they is two things. Um, they started using GPUs to train neural networks. So um, GPUs, graphics processing units, is basically like, um, you know, NVIDIA and AMD were in an arms race to, to sell cheap video game hardware for like the 15 years before this. And they were basically, you know, um, making as small and cheap as possible little parallel supercomputers on a chip that would do graphics processing, you know, rendering. Um, and around this time, and, and a couple of years before, people were starting to tinker around with that for scientific computing, uh, so-called GPGPU, general purpose um, use of the GPU. And, um, and so they were the first to, to go along and, 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 and say, oh, this is, it's, it's perfect for this kind of math. We're just doing large matrix operations. Um, that's great. You can do that on GPU very easily. Um, and so that enabled them. When you do that, you get roughly a 30 times speed up um, sort of just out of the box for implementing the existing algorithms that you know, had been, people had been doing before. So that means that instead of taking weeks and weeks to train um, an image mo net model, you can train it in a day, depending on how big it is. Um, and that enabled them to just rapidly iterate much more quickly on some different design choices of the, of the, of the architecture of the neural network. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, ImageNet itself really was not, uh, you know, in the 80s when neural networks started, people were using two and three level neural networks. Um, training on a data set of this size um, would have been inconceivable because of the computation, but there was no training set of this size. It would have been so laborious and expensive to manually annotate a million images with a thousand classes. Like, think about what that's like, you, you, you know. Um, it's, it's hours and hours of man labor. Um, but what happened was that, you know, this is sort of, you know, post-internet post stuff. So there was Flickr, there was, you know, Tumblr, with people just, like, crowdsourcing tags. There was Amazon Mechanical Turk, where people, you know, you could just sort of crowdsource and parallel distribute a whole lot of work. Um, and that's how they produced ImageNet. Um, and that really, so the combination of the availability of all this better labeled data and the GPU and some, um, you know, quite, you know, th th those are the big things. Even without any, any more tweaks to the basic uh, training algorithm, um, we would have done, you know, a lot better. But then they also, you know, started iterating very, very quickly on the performance of these models now that they had faster ways to train on them and, and, and visualize them. Um, and so in 2013, um, uh, this bottom dot, uh, the, you know, the winner this year was Matt Seeler, who is the CEO of Clarify. Um, and so basically that, that, that formed the, the core of uh, Clarify's technology. Um, in 2014, Google won. We didn't enter. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the, the performance went down from, you know, 25% error to uh, roughly 15 to 10 and a half to, now it's at 7 this year. So it's like dramatic performance when we're talking about like 1 or 2% per year. Um, and the size of these models got bigger. Now we're doing 10,000 class models, 50, 100,000. And um, there's a lot of, uh, the, the field is just very, very rapidly advancing. Um, okay, so let me switch gears a little bit and talk about um, using this technology to, um, to help make sense of all the images that you would record if you recorded your life. Um, so this is an idea that goes back a long way. I mean, probably um, since the dawn of time and you know, people have been thinking about this and, and, and in some sense the whole idea of writing down a story in, in a book is, you know, the beginning of this idea. But um, in the 40s, um, Vannevar Bush uh, published an article in the Atlantic, I think it's called the the way we think, or something like that. Uh, anyone know? As we may think, as we may think. So, um, and he sort of laid out the, the foundation for thinking about, you know, what 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 it would it be to have a system that you know could really, you could externally store your whole memory of everything that happens to you and all your documents. And he was more focused on documents than he had this crazy idea of like a, a desk basically that had like a photocopier and it was like a, a file cabinet and you could also take pictures of stuff and retrieve it, um, and. Um, and that, you know, uh, was sort of the beginning. Um, the, once we started having small digital cameras, then the next obvious step was like, oh, I'm just going to wear a camera around all the time. Um, so 
Um, I'm not sure if this is the very first model, but um, Steve Mann was wearing you know, cameras uh, in the late 90s. Microsoft was working on SenseCam. Um, and then it became another product of, yeah, the Vicon Review. Um, and, um, and then this is, uh, was Mimoto, which eventually changed their name to Narrative, which is the device that I was wearing um, to capture the images I'm going to show. Um, that's me with Google Glass. Um, so, you know, there's, there's the usual story about miniaturization of hardware and storage uh, capacity of, of electronic devices, comp compute power like on these devices, um, and then the miniaturization of the cameras as well. Um, so, uh, this, was the, this is the narrative clip. Um, I lost mine. It popped off on a bike ride a couple weeks ago. But, um, uh, so, I wore it for a couple of months last year when I first got it. Um, it has a camera, it has an accelerometer. Um, the new version has, uh, has wireless, but not enough battery to run it all the time, so you still have to plug it in to take your images off it, but you know, this is, we're getting there. Um, that's me looking cool, wearing the device in the mirror. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so, you know, this is like, um, the first thing I wanted to do once I got it was run image recognition on it. Um, so, let me just, if I can figure out how to, switch screens here. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a little bit of a very, very crude, I can call it an illustration. Um, so the photos that I, that, the, so, oh, sorry, I didn't mention, it's a time-lapse camera. So it takes a shot every 30 seconds. You can like tap it to mark a bookmark or something like that. But basically it just kind of um, snaps moments. There's no audio um, in this particular device. Um, so I took all those images and, and I ran it through recognition and, and put it into a search engine, essentially. Um, so now, like, you know, my, um, those couple months are searchable. So I just searched for cafe. Um, and so, you know, there might be some people in the room in some of these photos. <laughs> um, here's Gilad. <laughs> um, so let's, let's, you know, go, let's go there. Me and Gilad at a cafe. Um, and, you know, there's, there I can go through the time lapse. Um, and, you know, there's other tags in here. So, um, so what, you know, what, what do you, okay, now what? What, what? what is this for? What do you want to do with this? Um, so, you know, one, some of my favorite examples are like, um, so refrigerator, if I remember, was not particularly well. Yeah, so there's not too many refrigerators, but I think food shelf. <laughs> They'd be creative in how you label these things. I should also say that these particular images are terrible. They're, they're, they're you know, they're very grainy. The, the, um, you can wear the device at any angle and it's like on your clothes so it's always kind of like around and the accelerometer is supposed to be oriented so you can uh, you know, orient them correctly but it's, as you can see, pretty not good at that. Um, so as a computer vision problem, this is pretty hard. Like, um, it's, it's fairly um, challenging for the... So you know, I want to know like, what is in my refrigerator. So when I'm at the grocery store, like, oh, do we have... Are we, are we out of salsa? <laughs> do I need to get more salsa? So like, here's me, like, you know... Uh, and so the point is that it's like the ambient stuff that you go about your day, like what happens if that becomes searchable? Um, <laughs> and um, let's see. And some of those sentiment tags like I talked about before, you know, so fun. Uh, I think fun in the park or something. It's a little slow here. Um, the demo is much faster than this. I think it's the network here. I'm going to blame it on that. So. Yeah, parties in the park, capturing those moments. Um, it's pretty interesting to think about, you know, a lot of this stuff you can get by geotag. You know, if you just know the location of all your photos, then it, you can go pretty far away to answering some interesting questions about your life that way. Where do I go? But there's some things that just quite, you know, you don't really, you can't do it without knowing what's in the pictures. Um, what, ambulance? I think a crash. I'm trying to remember these queries. Um, so there's a lot of me riding a bike. Um, yeah, so here's the ambulance. Um, so didn't come for me. I'm just pointing it out. Um, without some kind of image recognition, these photos are basically um, me sitting in front of my computer for hours and hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Another thing we can do is um, 
cluster these in time. Oh, actually, let me show one thing first. So let me go back to go back to the cafe. Um, or so we can also sort of. I clicked on one of those images with this little eye icon, which does essentially like a visual search um, using the the image similarity metric and. Um, you know, you can find the same object, in theory, um, or a similar looking scene at least. So you can start to cluster, you can start to cluster by, um, by particular, particular images. You could even query this the way that I queried in the first demo where I just took a shot from my phone or uploaded a photo and found similar things. Um, you can, all, of course, imagine adding face detection to this, face recognition. Um, and then if we group things sort of by, by scene um, and Sort of treat it more like um, treat it more like a movie. Um, then you can once computers are finished doing their things, um, yeah, you can sort of imagine a little bit of a movie strips of your life. Um, there's not enough data in this one. So I want to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about the implications of all this stuff. So um, well, uh, there seems to me a pretty, a pretty clear um, bimodal distribution in terms of people I talk to about this. Some people are like, "When do I buy it?" Um, some people are like, "Hell no, are you crazy?" Um, so actually, before I even say anything, raise your hands if you're like, I want this today. Raise your hands if you're like, hell no, never. <laughs> raise your hands if you're like, hmm, interesting, let me see. Okay, okay. Maybe it's not quite bimodal. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm in the I want it today camp. Um, and I often have to, I, I feel like it's, um, it's it's hard to even explain why I want it, but so you know I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Like you know, like it just seems to me obvious that this is useful and I, I want it. And then partly I think it's because me personally I have, I have terrible narrative memory. Um, the past is just like one undifferentiated blob, um, <laughs> and uh, and so I'm very you know and I, and I'm sort of also at the same time deeply nostalgic. I, I feel like deeply feel the loss of the past, and uh, and so in some ways this is kind of just like an attempt to like hold on to something that's gone. But of course, there's all these like, practical um, you know, ways that this can be used. You know, sort of finding stuff in the refrigerator, where are my keys, um, you know, where, where was that cafe that was so awesome that I passed on the street, the, the movie poster I saw, oh, I didn't show. Like, you know, you can also say, um, you know, I'm still clustered. You can read the newspaper articles that you, <laughs> that you read. You can reread them, re them again. Um, and, um, Where's my newspaper? Yeah, here we go. Here's a, here's a paper I read. I can read that. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, I think that the, so let me go through some of those things. OK, so I, there's also a level at which I'm like, my experience is mine. I should be able to use it again some, some way. Like, I've, I've lived that moment. I should be able to make use of it some way. This is like a natural ability everyone has if you've got a good memory. <laughs> If you don't have a good memory, well, we can help you. Um, you know, what, what are the things that you've forgotten? Like, it, it, maybe there's nothing more valuable to you in your life than your experience. Um, I'm also very interested in the questions of, like, what this does to interpersonal relations. Like, uh, maybe this is less so about images, but if we start recording, you know, audio and then you have conversations, um, did you really, you know, did, did you really say that? Like, you know, you're convinced that you, that you told your friend that you were going to meet them somewhere, and did you really? Um, or, you know, I, I think that sort of idea of this stuff is a mirror um, to, uh, you know, look at yourself and your own life, um, even through your own eyes again. I find, I find that, the, um, that the experience of, you know, re-watching uh, uh, an experience that you had before, you do not, obviously, Maybe it's obvious, but you do not experience it again the same way you did. You know, you are now an observer, 
And as an observer, not the sort of subject of your original experience, it's quite a different experience. You have a, you have a different perspective on things. Um, there's all the uh, sort of analytic potential of this stuff. So you know, this is, um, I don't want to spend too much time, but there's like a lot of history of people who've been you know, doing personal analytics and all kinds of um, 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 building systems to kind of you know, track and answer questions about, you know, when do you send emails? This is Stephen, Silver, Stephen Wolfram has been doing a lot of stuff. And um, you know, this is like night and day. You can see his sleep patterns here. Um, this was somebody plotting all the music they listened to on, uh, on Last FM. Um, um, then I think there's a sort of archaeological and sociological um, angle to this. Like, um, and this, uh, I was here for the talk last week, and you know, the, the talk then was about this idea of cultural heritage. Um, all the data that's being produced right now, like the, the, the arch, you know, imagine that archaeologists today wanting to know something about ancient Rome or, or the Americas like, could look at your email um, or see all the pictures that you took in your day. I think that, um, to me, that's a fascinating, um, a fascinating topic. Um, and you, know, you yourself can be the archaeologist of your own life you know, five years from now. Like, what was I like in college? I don't even remember. Um, there's also kind of, you know, we can't talk about this stuff without talking about surveillance. So this is a live feed of some video cameras in New York right now. Um, you're already being recorded. Like, your life is being recorded now. And you don't own it. And you, you know, um, you, you don't even necessarily know where it is. Um, to, to me, I think there's a sort of a, a, a kind of a, um, it's almost like a right to bear arms, right? Like, the state has this power. Shouldn't you also have the power? Um, otherwise, the kind of, you know, who controls the narrative? If you get into a dispute with the state or with another person or get into a car accident or something like that, I think, you know, in the future, there's going to be a quite, um, you know, tricky set of issues about, you know, who, whose evidence, you know, can be admissible or, or just kind of a... Um, or even the analytics questions, right? Like, you know, who gets to know, in some sense, the advertisers, just based on your browsing behavior, know more about you than, than you do now. Um, OK, so on the other hand, there's the you know, hell no people. Um, and I think some of that is just, you know, well, there's a few things. One is that like, that's just hoarding. You don't need all that stuff. Throw it away. Um, you know, Snapchat is like designed on the principle that, like, Live in the moment, like just you know, throw it away. There's always more. <laughs> this is this is not fair to Steve Mann, but like you know, there's a, like a just a creepy factor. Like it's just like weird. <laughs> um, you know, this is like not a human acceptable behavior. <clears throat> um, and then there's of course the surveillance fears. You know, who? What happens if somebody gets that data? Uh, it could be a malicious hacker, or it could be the United States government. This is the Bluffdale's data center, the NSA. Um, so this is the first cell phone I, I owned. It's a Nokia 6160. I thought, I thought for a long time, so I was a cell phone resistor. Um, and maybe, remember back, raise your hand if you were a cell phone resistor. Are you the people who raised your hands before to say, to say no? Because I wasn't. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't. I'm like, you know, I'm a little bit of a Luddite. I don't want a technology that's, that's not ready yet. Um, but there's some things that I'm, you know, ready to be an early adopter for, but I didn't want a cell phone for a long time. Um, and I think that, like, you know, looking back on it now, it's, it's sort of hard to put yourself again in that mindset of, like, what it was like before everybody had a cell phone. And there was really people who, like, just said, no, I don't want to be reachable all the time. And, and now, like, you can't go anywhere. Like, everyone takes it. Raise your hand if you have a cell phone, but you don't carry it around with you every single where, unless you're willing to keep it in your purse. Impressive. Um, be here now, right? So this is the other sort of um, aspect of this, right? Is this going to be more of us walking around like this all the time? Um, Google Glass, one of the design principles was it was supposed to be a way to get you out of that, right? You just record everything so you don't have to be looking at it now. I don't really know if that's worked. That's basically, I think of it as a design challenge, really, more than anything else. Um, so this is reality TV. Um, 
you know, back to the question of like what happens when, like, let's assume for a second that this is going to happen and everybody has one. What does that do to interpersonal relations? Like, um, do we become more honest because we know that we're on the record and we know we can be held accountable for what we say and do? Do we become nicer? Or do we just turn into reality TV stars that are just like, totally self-conscious and you know, honing their image all the time? My daughter, <laughs> uh, this is her fake smile, right? So now, now like, at some point in this last year, she learned to like, smile for the camera. And I remember the first couple of pictures when she had this fake smile, and I was like, that sucks. <laughs> so um, maybe just to kind of frame the discussion uh, a little bit, um, my feeling is that, um, you know, there are people who want this. The technology is basically ready now, give or take a year. Um, I think that some of the guiding principles that ought to you know, govern the way that these things are built are, you know, it's all about consent. We can have a discussion about the, 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 the privacy and the etiquette around, you know, when can you go off the record? Who gets to say if you're off the record? If we're together in a room, who gets to own that data or share it? Um, and then again, you know, privacy, where if, you know, who, what, what are the responsibilities for whoever is storing this data for you? And the design challenge of like making it so that you're actually like in the moment and allowing this technology to free you so that you don't have to be writing stuff down all the time and, and, and taking your cell phone out to take pictures and not seeing the world like this. Um, that's it. Contact me at Adam and Clarify if you have questions and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Questions? All right, I'll start. So, a couple of us in the room have spent an obscene amount of time thinking about police-worn body cameras, mm -hmm. um, which are rolling out in, in uh, all sorts of places. And one of the things you raise is the idea, not just of surveillance, but the idea of taking back the power um, uh, by being able to see and have access to, to your images. What's at stake right now in police worn body cameras is we're actually seeing the battles over who gets to access what footage, who gets to take that footage, and what are the implications in all of these levels. Um, in fact, we get some of the questions that you're asking about how do people behave, and some of the early studies have shown some really interesting and conflicting um, stories about it. But part of what I find so challenging in the conversation is that Marginalized populations often hope that the new technology will give them power against larger institutions who have a long-term and long-standing level of power. Mm -hmm. But that assumes time, that assumes technical capability, that assumes the resources of a variety of things to get there. So as you think about rolling this out, most of your vision is about the idea of individuals and what they can do with their own lives, which takes a level of um, time, energy, uh, technical capacity. Um, and I think about the things that could be happen of institutions who are already powerful and have the resources to do it. Yeah. How do you think about making certain your technologies are used for a direction that could be productive and not corrupted for something that could be another abuse of power that is already in, in motion? Well, so at one level, <clears throat> um, if there's no consumer product that can do this, then just de facto, because of the proliferation of you know, security cameras everywhere and on the street and in the workplace and everywhere ex except for your home right now, then you know, we, you're basically starting from a position where uh, the institutions have everything and, and, the, and the, um, the populace has nothing. So we only have up to go from there. Um, you know, on the other hand, um, I think that the, yeah, I mean, all this stuff needs to be, you know, we're sort of post Snowden. Um, and so the, you know, the reality of like what happens to the data once it's recorded needs to be considered for sure. Um, but, that's, but that is not at all specific to, uh, to this particular use of technology. It's like everything, all your data. Um, so I think that it's basically, um, but yeah, I do see it as democratizing. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, like, uh, what, what amendment is the right to bear arms? Is that the third? Second, Second amendment? Um, I mean, I do somewhat see it that way. I, th I see it as um, a, uh, a question of, of um, where the technology is and, and, who, and who gets to own it. Um, I don't think that there's, so it's also just, I mean, the question of price is obviously like crucial to this, right? So, um, but if it's a, if, I mean, I, 
Apple is making expensive devices that everyone is buying because it's useful enough um, that you know people that, that that people are willing to spend money on it. So I think that that there is a um, you know a good chance that um, that this can become you know some, that fairly widespread in the next five five years in a way that can can significantly shift the the power against institutions in terms of like who can control that data and own the narrative. Hi. Uh, so, hypothet this is a hypothetical, but uh, let's say I was mashing up this image data with a pulse sensor yeah. that took my pulse. Yeah. And then um, I wanted to infer what happened when I saw a particular color of individual. Uh, what happens to my, you know, one of the outcomes is I'm a closeted racist. Possible eventuality. Yeah. Second, uh, how does it augment my decision making, change my decision making? Let's say I have a image repository that spans back my adolescent life. Right? And I were to say, hey, let me see what kind of women I like. And I sh filter the images which have women and show me a pulse rate where I have a heightened pulse. And then, that, and then I base my decisions of matchmaking based on Something like this. Mm -hmm. How crazy is that, first of all? <laughs> second, second is the whole question of serendipity. I mean, we're just annihilating serendipity from our culture with stuff like this. And I don't mean it in a negative way. It's almost like, you know, I'm, my wife and I, we, we have this discussion where we were at a specific place like five years back, and we, didn't, we weren't married at that time. But we were like, hey, were you there at that same place as well? And, you know, and then you could say, hey, why don't we just see if we saw each other yeah. five years back. I mean, that's just out outcomes of culture that we have not programmed as yet. So I mean, just what's your general reaction to, to So uh, pulse, pulse rate's really, really interesting. So um, you know that it's possible to take someone's pulse from, from a, a video, right? So you don't need to be you yourself wearing it. So a couple years ago, they showed, you know, if you do the right kind of filtering, increase the contrast, you can actually see blood vessels under the skin. And with significant, you know, not even crazy amount of, of video resolution, you can take people's pulse. So not only could I measure my pulse, I could measure your pulse and see if you <laughs> have a reaction to, to me. Um, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, well, so yeah, but like, okay, let's, let's, let's go further with that. So what does that mean? Like, does that mean, so if we have more visibility into, um, I would, I would call that sort of like the, 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 the hidden data in interpersonal reactions, right? In interpersonal relations. Um, <clears throat> and very much so for pointing it to yourself, but even maybe potentially for you know, pointing it at other people. Um, I th you know, there's a lot to learn there. So if you, if you do that and you, and, and you, you determine that you're a closet racist, then that's great. Now you know that. Now you can actually like try to get better at it and see over time that you do. Um, or you know, if you're you know in a, you're you're interviewing somebody for a job and you can <clears throat> see your see your own bias. Um, that's pretty interesting. As far as serendipity, um, I'm not sure that this would kill serendipity. I mean, it's like like you said, you know, you could you could surface those moments later, and it's kind of amazing. Um, I parked my car in front of Anya's house five years before I met her when I was on a road trip in New Orleans and I was staying at my friend's house who lived across the street from Anya. She was in high school. Did I see her then? Well. Oh, sorry, Anya had a question. She's got the mic. <clears throat> sorry, so the, getting back to Dana's questions about surveillance, I mean, the new element you're introducing here is not recording, it's actually seeing, right? So um, the, the, the computer has the ability to interpret it, the images that it sees. And you know, in the, in the warm body cam, in the body camera example, that could be like, there's some alarm that goes off when there's blood in an image, right? So what are the additional responsibilities that go along with that when you're sort of delegating some of the interpretive power, possibly, to the computer? Um, so do you, do you currently have a, uh, a legal responsibility to call 911 if you see somebody on the street who's hurt. Legal experts are shaking their head. Clearly, you have, you, it seems like you have an ethical uh, you know, duty to 
depending on your ideas of ethics, but uh, as far as I know, you don't have a legal responsibility to. So maybe that's you know, a distinction to, to keep in mind. Is that something that you, 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 if it's not a legal responsibility, and we all agree as a society that that is something, you know, a particular way to behave, then I think you don't want to force it into the system. You don't want to like, inherently bake it into the system and say that this is, must be the way that it, that it behaves. You want to give it as a choice to the user. Certainly, that's like an awesome, that's an awesome feature. You know, if it like, so yes, turning on the self and saying um, the medical implications of this stuff, like am I breathing heavier you know, than I used to, looking at the trends of, of you know, the last five years, do I, um, whatever else, how, how am I eating, <laughs> like what's my eating behavior, all kinds of stuff um, that, that you can measure from this data. Um, and then I think it ultimately comes back down to, yeah, like there's questions that can be answered. I think the users, the users should have the control over A, whether they want those questions answered and to see the answers, and then B, what then to, you know, how to act on it. Um, yeah, I think as an early warning, the health system, there's like all kinds of implications in here. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about <clears throat> what um, data, if any, um, should be deleted out of here. Yeah. So um, there's, there's two aspects. want. Two aspects of that. So the first one is just forgetting, right? You didn't say anything about bad memories. Yeah. So seeing people get killed, traumatic, violent events, stuff that your your brain naturally forgets yeah. to deal with stress yeah. and trauma um, that probably shouldn't be interfered with. I don't know, maybe there's psychologists thinking about that. There may be therapeutic aspects to that. I'm just curious, like, like what is the role of forgetting in all this? Um, and then this, the second piece around that is around, like, why does this data have to be kept around if you can analyze it and then store the results of your analysis and then destroy it, right? Because we know that third parties are going to use it in the future if they can get access to it. Better computation, better algorithms will be able to extract more information or stuff we didn't want to extract from in, in the future. like. And, and does that imply like a different information architecture? Like should we be thinking about doing much more of this at the edge rather than shoving it to the cloud where you know, it might be less private? So I think that there is therapeutic potential here. I mean, I think that some of the, you know, the more recent ways to treat tra trauma, psychological trauma, does involve revisiting the scene in your mind, sometimes even physically. Um, and re-encoding it with a different emotional valence. Um, so if you actually had a recording, you know, first person of the time you were robbed, um, that would be very, very difficult to, to deal with at first. But, but I think the therapeutic power of it could be quite, quite strong. Um, and as far as deleting, yeah, I think that, you know, the principle is you, 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 you put that control in the hands of the user, you let them delete anything. Um, what I, what I, the, you know, the questions I think are more tricky are like, if we are here together and having a conversation, do you have the right to delete my photo of it? Um, <clears throat> my, my personal feeling on that is, is no, but I cannot share it without your consent. That's, I mean, I, I don't have any grounding for that. That's my instinct. Um, and then, um, and as far as, as you know, um, whether the right thing to do is keep it all or try to do some extraction you know, up front and then just, and then just um, keep, the, keep the analytics. I think that's a, um, that's a technology question. Um, I mean, Gmail well, you know, was basically built on the principle that you keep everything because you don't know what you're going to want. And I think that's very powerful and, and successful. Um, you can still do all the analytics up front and you never have to look at the data. You know. Um, if you don't want to, but I mean, you even said you know we, you don't know what sort of better extraction and analytics potentials possibilities are going to come in the future. So if you have the raw data, you can never undelete. Um. Um, so I actually had a very similar question about forgetting, but yeah. maybe in its more mundane sense, um, a kind of question about how you envision if we all have this in some way how the fabric of social interaction will change. So I'm thinking about um, the role of forgetting in our sort of everyday life. 
you know, sort of, I forget that someone hurt my feelings last week, but then I run past it again. I mean, there are all kinds of anthropologists, philosophers since forever have actually talked about the importance of forgetting. Um, I, ha have you seen the Black Mirror episode? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, so that's like, they're, they're really important parts of not having to, not just relive a trauma, but to sort of smooth over mm -hmm. um, social, social well-being, I guess. Um, and maybe perhaps one of the reasons that Google Glass was, you know, became glass, worn by glass holes was like, there is, you know, we aren't just individuals walking around. We are members of a society. Yeah. Um, so I have a personal opinion about forgetting, which, I, I mean, I think that maybe the, the, the answer to that question kind of like maybe directly illuminates the difference between the people who want this and don't. Um, I, you know, my problem is not forgetting. I mean, my problem is remembering. So I, I want more help with, with, with remembering. There might be people who have problems forgetting, and then they, that's, that's, more, that's more appealing. And the idea of more things that help them remember is exactly what they don't want. Um, personally, I think that, um, that the, 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 the tools that this can, can give you in, as far as like, um, you don't have to remember it the same way, right? Like the sa same way, you know, about, about, about psychological trauma. Like if, if you have the memory there, also, first of all, an image is not a memory, right? It's still a, a sort of very, very thin fragment artifact of what the actual experience was. And, and really, every time you have a memory, you know, that's a new experience you're having. The memory itself is an experience, and the way that you have the memory is, is it can be different every time. So on, on one level, it's like, can this be a tool that we can revisit, like, like reading a journal article, I mean, like reading you know, a personal journal, or even just sitting there and thinking about something, but thinking about it in a different way and thinking, how have I changed since then? How have I, how have I grown? Can I see this with a new perspective? Um, but yeah, people who want to hold grudges, this is going to be awesome. You know, you sit there and just, you know, at home at night, <laughs> that's the time when, you know, just, just stewing in this stuff, absolutely. Uh, wait, there was a second part of the question. Oh, yeah, so as far as like the community goes, right? Um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's very lopsided if only some people have this. It, that is really problematic. Um, and, and, and it's certainly, there's going to be, you know, like American inequality is going to be such that the people who have this first will be rich. Um, and so that, that adds a whole other dimension to it. But, but even, even if any people have it and other, people's, other people don't, it's quite strange. It's, you know, what I wonder is whether it's like cell phones where it's like there's a, there's a, there's a peer pressure to get it once everyone has it and you're the one who doesn't have a cell phone and then you, you can't meet them at the bar. Um, I don't know if this will have that same kind of effect of bringing everybody into it. It might be like more dichotomizing that and that's definitely something to think about. Um, my question is very much in line with the previous uh, question. Um, I was wondering, since we're um, constantly shaping and reshaping our narrative about ourselves and our identity based on our experiences and memories and, and the things you tend to remember at that point or are useful at that point, I was wondering what is your experience um, over the last times that you've worn this thing that you can suddenly support this kind of uh, building up your narrative with data yeah. um, and with these pictures. How does that, has that changed your, the way you, you understand yourself? Um, so I also wore Google Glass for, for a couple months in, in the very early days when it was, um, you know, I think there was only maybe a handful of people in New York who, who, who had one. And, um, and there was, so, so part of it was the, the, the social awkwardness of, of that. It was almost like on the subway as a celebrity, I would, I would, I would see people like, like whispering and then like you know, come up to me, and, oh, is that Google Glass? Um, but, but the thing for me um, about wearing it, um, so that was more, I think that was more of a pr profound experience in terms of um, yeah, the experience that I had. Um, the narrative clip is smaller, people didn't know what it was. Um, sometimes people would ask, sometimes they wouldn't even notice. Um, 
And there's something about it not having it at, at eye level and on your head is, is definitely less, less extreme. Um, I found it to be um, more so with glass than this, but like I really, um, I felt free to not have to, to, I, to, I want not to be forced to pull my phone out and take pictures of stuff. That like, it was really big for me. Um, especially, I have so many awesome pictures of playing with my daughter. She was like one and two around that time. Um, and that was really, that was really great. Um, there have been like, you know, I've only really just put this data into like this kind of search engine like yesterday. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't, and it's and it's not there yet to be like really truly useful. I haven't done any an analytics on it, you know. Like, as my bike commute got longer or shorter since I moved, you know, to offices, kind of stuff. Um, so it's hard to say. It's hard to say about that sort of like, you know, factual usefulness of stuff. But um, I, I do, I do like the feeling of like when something awesome happens, knowing that like I probably have a photo of it. Um, Adam, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, I do want to push a little bit with the responsibility um, sort of concern or question, um, because you know it, it might not be the law for us to call nine one one if we see you know. However, I mean, for some people, they are obligated to report certain things. I'm thinking doctors um, if they see child abuse or something like that. Um, and I mean, I just learned of a law yesterday. It's it's a tariff act of 1930 that. If someone knows that a product has been produced by slave labor, they're not, the United States is not supposed to import it. And so you, know, you have all these other underlying laws and responsibilities that I can imagine that if, if an entity or a client is recording everything and, and matching images and such, they could become aware of something that they are obligated to act on. And, um, and so I just wonder, um, you know, with the ethics versus law issue, I, I do wonder whether sort of responsibility and maybe ethics could be part of some of the guiding principles, at least just thinking about them. Because, um, you know, with these new technologies, there might be more responsibilities um, sort of given to um, entities that are using certain types of technologies and products. So you reminded me of something, a point I wanted to make before. Um, and then I'll try to answer your question. Um, I think that probably, like, uh, you know, a major battlefront, legal battlefront with this stuff is going to be about whether your employee lets you wear this stuff at work. Um, if you work in one of those factories, I mean, think like the whistleblowing potentials and all this stuff. Like, you know, corporations obviously have, have a right to their own privacy and confidentiality about stuff. But, um, you know, so there's the sort of employee employee question. And then there's just like, can you walk into a restaurant wearing this stuff? Like, some of these early pioneers, Steve Mann, you know, practically got beat up at like a Starbucks or something like that, you know, um, yeah, McDonald's. Um, and um, and so, so I think that, you know, like my feeling about if you're in a public place and they have a security camera, then I uh, ought to be able to have one too. If it's your employer, then like, yes, you have, you have a duty to protect their, their confidential information, but I still feel I should be able to, to use that because I might get into an adversarial position with them also at some point and I want to be feeling like I have protection there too. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think that is going to be, that's going to be an interesting um, battleground and probably like, you know, I think there's going to be arguments um, made in, in the context of that, that that are relevant to your question. It's like, well, like, so let's say I'm a doctor and I want to wear this at, at my work. Does the hospital let me? Do I have, um, you know, if I get sued for malpractice, can I have a record that protects me and, and also um, implicates the hospital if they did something wrong? Um, yeah, I think that there, there are positions, you know, where, where people, people are in positions where they um, are, are making decisions that have consequences for other people where having a record is a very, very, can be a very, very sensitive record in terms of like legal uh, liability, but also can be a really powerful tool for like making things better. Um, so going back to the first half of your talk when you were explaining the neural networks, yeah. I thought it was really fascinating that you were able to assign, or that the network was able to assign sentiment to pictures. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if more users are using this, how, what are the biases or limitations? Does it, does it learn to change sentiment based on 
individuals or society as we, as we change? Um, short answer is yes. Like it certainly, it certainly can. And I think that you know, <clears throat> the proper, like a good product built around this stuff will be totally personalizable. Like you'll be able to teach it your idea of whatever. Like you know, the sort of default vocabulary that it knows now is not necessarily relevant to you. Like you want to be able to say, this is my cat, or you know, this is what I mean by a good burrito, or you know, this is what my friends look like when they're smiling, and this is the music I like. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's machine learning. It's like it can learn. And the, if you build a product around it that enables people to teach it well, it will. The reason why there's a lot of sentiment tags in there, by the way, is like we just, like the particular data we trained this on was just like tags we crawled from the web. And that's how people tag their photos. And it's amazing that it learned it. Like we didn't have a specific like face you know, detector in this particular model, like, but it knows what a smile is. It knows what a joy is when two people are hugging and smiling. Show you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I was just curious about um, memory as an ability. Uh, mm. So like in the 19th century, there was this photographer named Edward Maybridge who took a series of photographs of a horse galloping. And through that uh, sequence, we were able to find out how exactly a horse gallops because the human eye can't process how it. And we could find out that like a horse has all its four of its feet in the air at some point. Um, so I was just wondering how this might be considered as an ability where you know this is a kind of a like a time sensitive thing so like even if other people adopt this you know other people are going to have a far longer record of it so like how is memory how will it be sort of changed um, of memory being thought of as you know ability disability you know alzheimer's is a, is a very stigmatized um, so yeah. it, it is kind of a, a you know a power that you have of being able to look back and so I think that um, it's always gonna be faster to look something up in your own brain <laughs> than do this so people who have better memories and better memories of what of what type narrative memory you know memory for facts memory of languages vocabulary lots of different kinds of memory but Unfortunately or not, I don't know, what, depending on how you think about this, it's not like going to level the playing field in terms of you know, the differences between people on, in terms of how their brains work. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I mean, that, that question to me leads back to the question of equality. And like, now we're getting really pretty far into tools that are so closely integrated with yourself that um, that having it versus not having it um, puts you at you know potentially a major advantage um, against other people, and then yeah. Uh, um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the idea of consent of the other people in your photos, especially sensitive situations that take place in public. It seems yeah. like a really big issue. Um, I'm going to bring back up Gilad <laughs> 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 to illustrate this. Gilad didn't say I could do this. I mean, I'm picking on Gilad because like, I think he'd be a cool it. But, um, but <laughs> um, I, so when a woman walks down the street and gets whistled at, like, what boundary has been crossed? Like, you know, going out in public in some sense gives people permission to look at you. That's kind of like unavoidable. Um, leering at somebody and whistling seems to like violate them in some, so you're crossing some sort of consent threshold. Um, if you have a picture of somebody you took on the street by accident and you sit there at home staring at it, that kind of seems weird. They didn't give you consent to like stare at them. Um, on the other hand, it's not as bad as staring at them on the street because they don't know it and they don't feel it, which is like maybe like the main reason why that's bad. Um, I'm just riffing on ideas. I mean, I, I, this is, this is a, like just a deep question. I don't really know. Like I said before, I, I, think, I think the principles that do seem clear to me is that I should, any, any experience that I was like physically present at, I should be able to have a record of it. But that doesn't give me any right to share it with anybody else. 
um, without the, uh, another person's consent. And I can also, like the, the fine line about whether you have the right to delete a photo with you in it seems to be, there's a strong argument for that. I, I think that probably, that's probably like you have some kind of takedown rights. <laughs> um, but then again, how do you know what I have? So we're almost out of time and I'm gonna have to cut it off. But before I um, let you go, one of the things is you're the CTO of this company. Your responsibility is to figure out what these technologies do. And you're hearing a variety of different um, you know, ethical, social, uh, psychological concerns and narratives. Mm -hmm. What do you see as your responsibility as the CTO in figuring out how to negotiate what you're hearing today with what you're building technically? Um, so I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of things we could do with this technology that I consider evil. You know, I mean, th there's, there's the surveillance stuff, you know, um, I, I, I personally am not like interested in helping the military have more of this technology than they already have. Um, and I think that carries, that carries you know, f forth into this stuff in the, can, in the personal space as well. Um, I, what I'm interested in right now is, is, I mean, I think we're still far enough away. This is getting pretty close, but it's not quite here yet. Um, and so what I'm interested in is, is um, building things that let people ask and answer the right questions. Because I don't think we really can even ask the right questions, let alone answer them, until we have some experience with using this stuff. Um, and yeah, and I personally feel like it's like absolutely inevitable that like, there, you know, there are a lot of people working on this stuff. So I, I feel a responsibility to work on it at some level to know, to, to basically be involved in that, in that discussion and be involved in an informed way about it. Um, I think abdicating, you know, e even if I thought that this was wrong, and you know, it's not at the level of building a bomb where like once the cat's out of the bag, the cat's out of the bag. Um, so. Yeah, and then I, I think it's all about about putting it putting it in front of people and letting them letting them say and you know listening to what people ask for, object to, say they want or don't want. Um, and yeah, I would definitely like to continue the conversation with I think a lot of people in this room about like, you know, there's a lot of legal scholarship I think that you know can inform what happens here and and the history of a lot of these ideas of surveillance and. Um, and you know, ownership of, um, of records. It's quite interesting. That's it. With that, thank you so much for joining us. Okay.